Please good know because if I put the airports, I cannot hear you guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know all of you. Uh, I don't know you. Uh, I am Sujit. I am working with Rajendra. Okay. I am Jyoti. I am working with Rajendra. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, so we have not offered this course uh, ever in CHEP, but most of us work on this field. So it should have been better that we should have offered it long ago, but uh, the sheer number of courses we have uh, is that we don't get time to offer this course. So, but uh, what prompted me is in a way this 10 years discovery of uh, the Higgs boson. And, uh, and it sort of uh, set up some sort of a revolution actually. Uh, it's set up sort of uh, uh, the implications of this, we are still understanding it. We are still understanding the implications of this discovery. And in a way, for me, it looks like the more I think about it, it's some sort of a revolution in part of it. Okay. It has many, many implications. So we just think about, see about these implications and, uh, for, uh, and try to make threats to various physics beyond standard models. Okay. So I'll try to give some notes. Uh, um, after every two lectures or something, every week I will try to distribute some lectures you know, and set of references. You, there won't be any, because this is an advanced course, I am not taking any exams. No, no, uh, but it will be more like an informal discussion. So you guys interrupt me at any point, ask me any questions, anything, okay? And uh, Let's see how uh, we go about it actually. I will try to cover as many things as possible, but uh, it may be um, extremely hard to cover all the aspects of physics beyond standard model. Because there are, as of now, some million theories of physics beyond standard model. I don't think we'll be able to cover all of them, but we'll try to cover a few of them, at least classify a few of them. And by the end of the thing, course, my target is that you should be able to build your own Physics beyond standard models, actually. You should be able to build them and test them, find out what. Okay. So, uh, so to begin with, I'll uh, assume I'll do a small recap. Of the standard model. Now, all of you are experts on the standard model, but the reason I am going to do it because I will use a particular notation which I will continue to use all through, all through these lectures. I want to use one particular notation, one particular setting, okay, one particular. Uh, uh, thing which I'll use uh, through all through this uh, set of lectures for every theory actually, say even supersymmetry, extra dimensions, clockwork, or anywhere, I'll try my best to use only one notation so that it becomes easier so that we can make a connection to uh, these things very easily. So, so look, then what is standard model? Uh, Standard model is actually not one theory. We claim it's one theory. Actually, it's actually three theories. It's a combination of three theories. Okay. So one is quantum chromodynamics. Sometimes called QCD. Then it's weak interactions theory. Sometimes called Bellman, Feynman, and whatever it is. Then Q 
QED. This anyway you are all popular, I mean, this is the first thing we learn in any quantum field theory course. So it's a combination of these things. What it contains is sort of a UV completion of this theory. It contains a UV completion. What is a UV completion? UV means ultraviolet completion. Ultraviolet is in the sense of high momenta. Okay? This is high momenta. You are looking for the course? Yeah. yeah, come this way. Yeah, the room number I was told wrong. So, this one. so if the momenta is very, very large, so what are the scale of momenta we are dealing with here? The scales of momenta we are dealing with is, I will come to this number again and again, of the order of 100. Of 100. So the V minus A TV uh, is valid at scales much below 100 GV square. Okay. QED also the same thing. Okay. These are the this sort of sets the scales. I'll come back to these scales again and again. They will become important when we discuss the extensions of standard model. Okay. And quantum chromodynamics is the reverse. In a way, it is also a UV completion of a sum theory at low energy. The IR theory is not well known. The IR theory could be a couple of things which are either we have two candidates for the IR theory. We don't know what is the low energy theory of the theory. There are two typically two candidates to deal with it. One is lattice gauge theory, another is carrier perturbation. And the scale involved here is P square is equal to, I should put it this side actually. It's P square is equal to lambda Q C D square. It's about a GeV. It's around 1 or 2 GeV depending upon how you want to it. It's about 1 GeV. Definitely take it as the mass of the photon. Okay. The scale essentially is the mass of the photon. Below the scales of around the mass of the photon, this theory, which is a UV completion of either lattice gauge theory or current perturbation theory, is explained in terms of some sort of a unifying picture, which we call as uh, quantum chromodynamic. And then, then there is this weak attraction theory, which is also called V minus A theory. This you must have learned in your standard model course. What is V minus A theory? Uh, anybody? Vector minus axial vector. Okay. V stands for vector current. And A stands for axial vector. So, why does this have this uh, uh, particular? Uh, we come to that. Or one step. So this theory is V minus A okay. vector minus actual vector current. Vector current means what? Gamma mu, psi bar gamma mu psi. This is a vector current, Lorentz vector. Actual vector means psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi. Okay. So the theory of weak interactions, uh, you know, we must have heard about Fermi theory, right? It's a just an extension of the Fermi theory. Why you have to have an extension of Fermi theory with respect to uh, write it in this particular form, It has been formed by Sudarshan and Masha, this structure. So this structure violates parity. Violates parity. 
So, of the three theories you see, weak interactions are sort of special. Okay? They are sort of special. One, they violate parity. Okay? Secondly, in some sense, the other two interactions are also long distance interactions. Okay? The other two interactions are long distance interactions, whereas the weak interaction theory is a very, very short distance interaction. Okay? Violence, parity, and short distance. How do you know that it is short distance? Mediated is massless. So these two are mediated to massless. Okay, the range of the interaction you can equate it with respect to the Compton wavelength. Okay, and from the Compton wavelength we show that the range of this this range is infinity because purely because you can write uh, the lambda Compton which is crossed by MC, where M is massless or the mass of the essentially the mediated mass. Okay, and if you take M goes to zero, you get these two theories actually, the QED and quantum form of QCD. Whereas uh, this violates parity and also its short distance. What do you mean by short distance? That uh, it is like almost like a point-like interaction. It is a point-like interaction. So this you cannot, if you want to resolve it, okay. It's much harder compared to resolving uh, theories like QCD or um, QD. <clears throat> now, the fact that weak interactions violate parity itself is such a strong thing. So, what does it mean that these interactions are like in this particular form? Is that uh, so, the weak interactions only act on left-handed particles. So, that means their projection, so the spin projection on the momentum makes a huge difference. So, only particles whose spin is projected opposite to the direction of the momentum, only they, only when that happens, so if you take randomly a gas of particles, okay, with all kinds of spin projections. So, only when their spin projections are opposite to the direction of the momentum they have, they participate in weak interactions. Okay? Otherwise, they don't participate in weak interactions, they don't decay. Just if you think about it, it's completely counterintuitive and shocking actually. So if you take a random gas of photons, say for example, okay, so or electrons, when they participate, when they interact with electrons, they interact with all anyway. Whether their spins are up, down, whatever, their projection is this way or that way, they're always interacting. But when they want to interact with weak interactions, when they want to decay, weak interactions are typically decays actually, their spin projection should be always in the opposite direction of the direction of the moment. So, inherently, this means that these theories are chiral theories. This plays a very important role. Weak interaction is a chiral theory. So that means it sees only one particular chiral projection of all the particles. It doesn't see another projection. So it is preferentially sees only one particular chirality of the particles. It doesn't see other chiral projections. Okay. So this is a very very uh, important aspect when you go uh, even for physics beyond standard model. So here any questions? Whereas, to distinguish, so for example, uh, quantum chromodynamics and electrodynamics, both of them are vector like theories. So these are called sometimes in literature and they are vectorial in nature. QCD is called vectorial in nature. That means both. It doesn't distinguish, say for example, if gluon couplings in QCD, 
They don't distinguish whether the gluon is left-handed or right-handed, the quark is left-handed or right-handed. Both left-handed quark and right-handed quark couple the same way to the gluon. Okay? Now, this entire left-handedness and right-handedness came purely because of weak interactions. Okay? Because they have a chiral structure. <coughs> this plays in, uh, so this plays such a very important role, so much so that when we write down the particle content of the standard model, we write it down in terms of the chiral states. We write it down in terms of the chiral states. Okay. So let's start with looking at the particle content of the standard model. Now, to write the particle content, I will initially introduce something called the gauge group of the standard model. Because what it does, the standard model does, describes all the three theories in terms of one, uh, one particular quantum field theory. One particular quantum field theory, and all the quantum theory, uh, three quantum field theories have the same kind of property, and they are called gauge theories. All the three theories are called are written in terms of one particular symmetric uh, theory. It's called gauge local gauge on of theories. <coughs> I'll describe these things in a second, but for the present, just to discuss the uh, particle content, I need to discuss, introduce what is the gauge content of the standard model, or what is the gauge group of the standard model. The gauge group of the standard model is SU3C, I put subscript C because it stands for color, su 3 l because this is a color theory, times a new theory, a new symmetry called even Y, which is also called type of charge. Now, I will describe, uh, we will come to these things in you know, one second actually. Okay? I will describe uh, all the particle content in terms of the representations under this gauge. gauge. Okay? So, the particle content has quarks and leptons. So it is described in three generations. So let me write down. So but I'll start with writing one generation. Okay. So one generation. So you will see a lot of interesting aspects of the gen. So let's start by writing the quarks. U B L. This is equal to QL. I want to remember this notation. Okay, this is equal to QL. UR, BR, L. I'll describe each of them in a second. These are all fermions. This is the fermion content. of the standard model and I am writing in terms of the while formulas. Okay? While formulas. I will describe what these are. While formulas are two component spinors okay, which satisfy the massless while Dirac equation. So the first one, UL is a type left-handed, left-handed chiral state. Okay. 
okay dl is down type left handed current state so if this transforms as a doublet first of all it transforms each of this thing each ul and dl for any of these things transforms as a triplet under qcd okay so what it means that ul comes in three colors ul r ul g or b ul g this together i am calling it as ul so explicitly i am not writing the color index in principle i have to put the color index if i want to put the color index i have to put alpha here if i want to put the color index so it comes in three colors okay ul r b g okay so for the present let me and then the left handed parts of the quartz transform as a doublet transform as a doublet so doublet means like exactly remember like spin isospin is nothing but spin exactly like spin so <coughs> this is i uh, it's a it's a different nomenclature it's very much similar like a doublet particle with an up spin and down spin or tz values okay the tz values go down say for example half minus half along the along the column the t3 values go to half minus half so but the average value of this charge because there are three of them becomes 1 by 6 i'll tell you a formula how to get this actually okay the the average value uh, of the hypercharge is given by 1 by 6 the hypercharge is determined by an old formula which is called delman nishikawa formula Okay. Except that the Bellman-Nash schema formula was uh, instead of hypercharge, it had Baryon number and strangeness and so on. So except that this is the formula. So, for example, how do you get the one by six? So the uptake for as a charge which is plus 2 by 3 electric charge is plus 2 by 3 down take has a charge minus 1 by 3 okay so now you can plug in the formula so for 2 by 3 for the up type t3 value is half okay and the down type the t3 value is minus half okay my uh, this is should be minus 1 by 3 The only number which satisfies both the things is essentially y is equal to one by six. In a way, the hypercharge is nothing but the average charge of a multiplet. Okay, average electric charge of this one is one by three. It's two by three minus one by three is one by three divided by two. That gives me one by six. Okay. This counting is important because tomorrow if you want to introduce any new particles in any representation, you have to worry about how you to introduce the hypercharge. Now, next the right-handed part participates in we typically write as three bar, okay? But it's a singlet. Now there is one distinction between SU3 and SU2. In SU2, two and two bar are the same representations. Two and two bar are the same representations. Okay, uh, because what is it called? Pseudo real representations. They are not real. Okay, whereas SU3 has complex representations. So three and three bar are different representations. Okay, SU2 has pseudo-real representations because 
the sigma matrices cannot be written in a form where they are all completely real. Okay? There is no basis in which all the three sigma matrices are real. So you need to always change the uh, I meaning. In every basis, they are always one of them is completely real. So okay. Now, what is the hypercharge? There is only one particle. It is the average charge. Average charge is. Now, now this is of wild fermions. So, what do they contain in terms of the Dirac equation? They contain uh, U L contains each U L contains a left-handed quark. And right handed anti quark. So both of them are contained in UL. Okay? Left handed quark and a right handed anti quark. UR contains right handed quark and a left handed anti quark. UR contains right handed quark. And left handed anti quark. DR, what are its representations? 3 bar, 1 minus 1. Bar. So this is easy to write. Now when you come to L, okay, there is a Simple thing which happens, which is also used many times in dark matter phenomenology. Okay, say for example for the neutrino, what happens is the Q is zero, so these two cancel. These two cancel. T three and Y cancel each other, so it has a non-zero Y charge. Remember, for the neutrino, it has a non-zero Y charge, but a zero Q charge. So it is Y is chosen in such a way that total charge is zero. Now if you want to, if you say suppose if tomorrow you introduce a dark matter particle, it should be chargeless, but it can have non-zero Y. So that's how beams are introduced, so sort of thing, okay. So neutrinos have T3 half, T3 minus half, and what is the Y for this? The average charge is minus one by two, so minus 1 by 2 to 0 plus 1 by minus 1 by 2 minus 1 by 2 equal to minus 1. Okay. So these are doublets. The left handed parts, only the left handed parts are doublet. Again, I keep repeating this. Oh, this is the first one, singlets under SU3, doublets under SU2L, and minus 1. Either give minus half or half. There is some choice actually. Okay. y by 2, you can choose y to minus y, there is some freedom in the choice of y, but it can fit the charges. So this leads to some sort of uh, uh, unhappiness in the community because you, the y is not well defined in the sense that it doesn't have concrete charges. You, are, you, you can choose your y such that you can satisfy this equation, as long as you satisfy this equation, you can so if there is not one single solution, you can parameterize it in a slightly different way. Now you get come to a single, complete single physics. Now for future purposes, let me also introduce the right-handed neutrino. Are there right-handed neutrinos? We don't know. Okay. <laughs> we don't know. So 
As of now, I already introduced you one particle which could be physically or standard. As of standard, this is it. Now, the point is that whether it is standard, the reason I am introducing newer right now is because it lies at the border. It, it has its quantum numbers in such a way you cannot tell whether it belongs to standard model or whether it's out of standard. Okay, it's completely singlet, charge is zero, everything is zero. Okay. Its hypercharge is also zero. Okay? So whether it belongs to standard model or not standard, it doesn't belong to standard model. There is no nothing in the standard model which can tell you any theoretical principle or nothing which can tell you or which can get modified. You know. We'll see some examples of it later on. Okay, there is some some understanding about whether it can exist or not by some symmetry arguments, but purely from particle content, we have no way of testing these things as of now. We have no way of testing these things. There are some mild indications neutrino masses that there could be sterile neutrinos. Whether there are these right-handed neutrinos form the sterile neutrinos or not, it's a different question. Okay. Now, there is no, okay. Now, as far as the gauge theory is concerned, it just replicates like this three times. Okay. So what I do is I put an I here. I corresponds to three generations. I is equal to one, two, three. It just replicates itself. So you have one gauge theory for one generation. So you can write the standard model just for one generation. And it works, completely works. There is nothing which tells you anything else beyond it. Then why do you need you okay, we'll ask this question in the future. So, it replicates itself to three generations, i is equal to 1, 2, 3. Three generations. So, each generation has how many particles? Should be 15, just check. Okay. 15 particles should be there. These are three colors, right? Okay. So how many particles? Yeah. 15. So phonium content of the standard model is 45 over three generations. So each generation has 15 particles. So if somebody tells you that standard model is very minimal, it doesn't have many particles, it has only few particles, you can argue with them. It has 45 particles. Okay. It has 45 particles, E generation has, and P generation. So the matter content of the standard model is 45. So the fermions are also called the matter content. Okay. <coughs> they are 45. Then, in addition, there are two more sectors which are called the gauge sectors or the force content or the gauge content and symmetry field. Content is given by gluons. There are eight of them. And they 
transformation. These are vector spin 1 particles. <coughs> and the rate of them. And they transform as 8, 1. They are transformed in the joint representation. Remember, the matter is always transforming in the fundamental representation. Whereas the gauge content is transforming in the adjoint representation. Okay. <clears throat> Similarly, WUA, <clears throat> there are three of them. Why there are three? Because the adjoint representation of SU2 is three dimensional. Okay? So it's a singlet under SU3, triplet under SU2, and it has a charge. Then there is one more gauge boson associated with U, 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 A. Which is a singlet, singlet, and with a hypercharge. What is it? Does it have a hypercharge? <coughs> the human gauge boson never carries a charge. The gauge sector mixes after symmetry. I'll come to the symmetry part actually. It mixes. And then there is the famous Higgs boson. So how many gauge boson? These are also spin one. Spin one. So how many spin one particles in standard model? There are no generations in this. So how many? Eight plus three, eleven plus one, twelve. Total twelve spin one. We will see some modification for this later on actually. Now, the Higgs boson, um, though we write it, this is called so called the symmetry unbroken phase. Okay, the symmetry unbroken phase. Uh, most of you must have studied the spontaneous symmetry breaking. So when it breaks down, this is actually spin 0, it's a scalar. So what equations this satisfies, that satisfies the Dirac equation, this satisfies a massive spin 1 equation, which is called Crocker equation, or in other words, it's Maxwell's. symmetry breaking, this is some sort of fictitious thing. After this symmetry is taken away, there is only one single Higgs boson left, which is a spin zero particle, okay, a spin zero chargeless particle, neutral.
Now I am not writing any representation because it's neutral. First of all, because I am not writing any representation because when this symmetry is broken, it doesn't make any sense to write any representation under the broken symmetry. So now, how many total particles you have in standard one? Okay. 0.5 plus 13. Now, uh, let's just mention briefly the masses also. Uh, I will come to that. Uh, so, roughly the masses of gluons, gluon are massless, photon is massless, and Mw plus minus is equal to 80.3 or 80.2, or there is some. 80.4, there is some discrepancy, but anyway, you say Mz is 91.2. All in GV. I just use GV all through, but once I move to physics beyond standard model, I move to TV. Okay. As of now, it's just GV. So it's around 80 GV, 80 times the mass of the proton, this is 91 GV. And M Higgs is around 1.6, close to 1.6. 1.5.9. Now the error part has reduced significantly actually. It's very little. 1.1. Okay, let's look at the masses also quickly. Now when I'm writing these masses, I'm writing at a classical level. These are so-called the current masses, quote unquote. These are masses I am just quoting it, but this is not completely true. But once we come to the quantum Lagrangian, we will see that these masses require a renormalization scheme we have to define. What is the renormalization scheme under which we are defining these masses? Okay. As of now, let me just write down these masses. So similarly, let's write down the masses for the fermions. Quickly write down the mass. So here we have to write down all the three generations. So let me write it down in this manner. Me is uh, half a movie or so into ten power minus three GV and tau and mu is one of five in V and ten power minus three GV one point seven five G. Question comes, so what about, does it make sense to define, ask anybody asking the question, say, uh, if somebody asks the question, what is the mass of the quark? Does it make any sense? If yes, yes, why? If no, why? Does it make sense? Because quarks are completely composite objects. They, they are never themselves. It's not like you can measure the quark, at least the light quark. You can find a ground state in which UU, UU bar condensate is there, and you can measure it. There is no particle with the UU bar condensate. The pi, on, pi zero is UU bar plus DD bar. So you cannot individually measure okay, the quark masses. So most of the time they are in bound states, and at the moment you try to measure them, they produce infinite number of gluons and these gluons will again reproduce depending upon the energy other quarks so they are always mixing some quark flavor is getting mixed always due to the quark gluon production okay for example if you take a pure uh, pion or say for example you take proton so 
this thing was subsidized in equal and scattered. So, in a proton, it is made up of three quarks. Okay, u, u, and b. Okay. <coughs> But if you want to measure the quark content of the proton, you will find all the other quarks also. You can find some strangeness content, okay, you can find some charm content also, a little bit, a little bit of charm content, purely because the moment you try to probe what is the uptight content of the quark, or in fact, at high energies, you know, the most dominant content of the proton is essentially gluons, okay. At high energies, it's completely dominated by gluons, okay. So, to make sense what the quarks mean, uh, what a quark mass means, it is not easy to do direct experimental light quarks. What I am mean. what, what, what talking about is at the light quark level. It does not make sense to talk at an at a experiment level. At an experiment, you cannot get information about light quarks. So, but what you can do, you can do it on a lattice. You can do a simulation on a lattice and the light quark masses. Are coming from a lattice computation. So typically, lattice computes some matrix element, which is called MUD, which is the UD content. Okay, okay. <coughs> it is some matrix element called MUD, with which we infer what is the light quark masses. So if you go to PDG or any other things right now. The lattice computations are so well that you measure uh, the light quark masses are defined in terms of the lattice computations. So these typically come out to be between 3 to 4 MUD. So these are called to distinguish. Uh, so these are called current states, current quarks, and the rest of the content uh, quarks are called C quarks. One is called the current quark, others are called C quarks. Anyway, these are the current masses, okay, current masses in some renormalization scheme as well. Okay, we'll come to that. I don't know how much detail I'll go, but anyway. So the roughly masses are around 3 to 4 million few times larger than the electron mass. The MS mass around 92, 92 MeV. The strange quark mass is around 92 MeV. Charm is around 1.3 G. Oh, I should put G here, and go minus 3. G, I said that I write everything. Here. This is 1.2 G. Some classical symmetries which this as well. Okay, these are called light quarks. This is some sort of an intermediate thing. Okay, charm is a complicated object. Okay, it's at the intermediate level. These two, this is typically what we call as a heavy quark. Typically, B favorite is around 4 point something GeV. 4.7 GeV or something. 4.2 or 7. Uh, close to 5 GeV, so 4.7 GeV. And the top part is around 172 GeV.
rest of all of them form only bonds. Top is the only one which doesn't form any bond states because uh, it's so heavy and so it's very short lived, it doesn't have time to form bonds. So, in terms of the mass range, it's about six orders of magnitude in GeV. Top versus electron. So, six orders of magnitude. So, if you normalize everything in terms of electron mass, the top mass is 10 power 6 times the mass of the electron. 2 times 10 power 6 times the mass of the electron. So, if you want, 2 into 10 power 6 times any. Maybe 4, actually, <laughs> maybe 4. Four times ten power six So how are these measured? Electron mass is well known. No, the mass of the charm and the mass of the charm is a well known exponent. It is measured at uh, at e plus e minus collider. Okay, all these things are measured at e plus e minus colliders. Okay, the top is the only one which is measured at hadron colliders. Like Fermi lab measured it. So it is discovered there. Now, at, uh, let's see. The rest of them all are at e plus e minus collider. B factor is you know very well. So they form bound states. These bound states are called epsilon bound states. Okay. And uh, similarly, we have charm bound states, such as DD bar, D bar bound states. Okay. They are discovered. Charm was discovered in 1974. Okay. Yeah, these are covered in your uh, nuclear and particle physics course. So I'm just going to yeah. Now I need this information. That's the reason I'm writing that. That I want this information. <laughs> okay. Later on, I want this information that these are extremely varied. Okay. But so the reason I am mentioning this is at the look of it, there seems to be no approximate symmetry. When do you say there is an approximate symmetry when there is some degeneracy? Okay, when there is some degeneracy or when there is some uh, if the masses are very close to each other. Okay. So if you find some an approximate degeneracy, you think that there is some symmetry associated with it. But here there is no degeneracy, they are extremely hierarchical. So there is no immediately obvious symmetry associated with it. But the way they get their masses, okay, in the Lagrangian there is some classical symmetry, which is seems to be extremely badly broken. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, so to, now let's write down the classical Lagrangian. I'll just write it down as the classical Lagrangian. This is really a lightning review of the standard model diagram. <laughs> I have, I'm just going to tell everything at in maybe one class or one and a half class or something like that. Because uh, I need to move beyond. Uh, so the classical Lagrangian. What do you call as classical Lagrangian? I'll tell you in a second because I want to distinguish this with the quantum Lagrangian. Okay, because we want to see some symmetries which has come at only at the quantum level. And they all play a role. So, what is the classical Lagrangian? Uh, the best way to remember the Lagrangian or the standard model because it's complicated. To write it in terms of different sectors. Okay, so LSM, I write it as L formula. A gauge and you cover LSM. Symmetry break. Okay. 
So this is exactly like the order we introduce the particle content. Okay. So th this way we remember it. I'll try to use the same structure even for physics constant. Okay. That's the reason why I wrote it down because that way it's easier. At the classical level, you can actually at the quantum level everything gets mixed up, of course. Okay. <laughs> this one will come together, this one will come together, and so on and so on. At the classical level, you can actually nicely separate it into various pieces, and so you can remember it. So what is L-fermion? L-fermion is nothing but the kinetic terms of fermions. Ah, sorry. I did a slash. Okay. Where F, the index F runs for all the fermions. Okay. F runs for Q, U, B, R. And what is D slash? D is equal to del mu is equal to solid del mu. D slash is equal to R um, del mu, gamma mu, oh god, I am writing it wrong. Of course, this acts only for particles which are not singlets. Okay, this only acts for particles which have uh, doublets, and so on and so on. But this is the general form. Okay, the details you guys can work it out. So, so I'll use the notation that GS stands for uh, strong coupling, G stands for weak coupling. G prime stands for hypercharge. Accordingly, we introduce part, uh, couplings. Again, these are at the classical level as of now. We will do the alpha is, we will do the quantum level. At some point, this, I call it as MS bar couplings. Okay, we need to define a renomination scheme and everything. Where alpha is defined as G square by 4 pi, alpha is G by Alpha electromagnetic is used instead of alpha y. Typically, we use alpha electromagnetic, which is e squared. Okay. Once I write down uh, uh, the symmetric breaking part. So, in addition, uh, okay. Now the gauge, this is a fermionic Lagrangian. L gauge are the kinetic terms of the gauge boson. So, again, would be whereas 
The non abelians are distinguished with an A symbol because they have more of them. So each of them we need to expand. G mean u A is equal to let me u until u g mean plus g s f a b c g mean b g c. Okay. Similarly, uh, W mu K U T, then mu W mu K, then mu W mu K, plus G, F A mu C, these are the weak structure constants. W mu K W mu B. Oh no. F A B C are essentially the structure constants of the relevant gauge groups. Okay, so P gauge for example. And then there is the F mu. W now I have not uh, this is still the classical Lagrangian. I have not put any gauge fixing term, counter terms, nothing. But this is sufficient uh, for the present. Let's do this. So this gives you kinetic terms of everything, okay, of all the weight bosons and for you. Okay. So this a a right here runs from one to eight, whereas for the w's it runs only from one to two. Okay, that you remember that. Okay. I think you wrote uh, B over in this space, Raju. Oh, okay. This it has B. Okay. I'm writing in the symmetric unbroken phase. Okay. Now this is true for all the downtime particles. Okay. Say for example, let me write down explicitly because this will be useful. So uptype for u would be written as uh, q bar. This is the notation I'm going to use. I y i j u R J H tilde. I tell you what tilde is. This is going to be the notation in complete class. Actually, all the all the D R J H plus Y E I J L I D R J H. Now, HC depends upon whether you are overcounting or not, you have to make sure of it. Okay. Now, H tilde, you put the I sigma to just to make uh, interchange the hypercharge. Okay. You want to interchange the hypercharge because of that force okay, uh, get masses from the outside of the the neutral part rise and below. Okay, let me expand this term. One term I'll expand so that you understand it. Okay. Okay, I'll also introduce one notation. The SU2 invariant is introduced by in terms of the sigma magnitude. Okay. Anything which is SU2 invariant, we just take the what 
topic of anti-symmetric combination of the components. So qi dot h means under issue 2 epsilon a epsilon b. Okay. Now h is what? h plus h0. Q is u and b left handed parts. So left handed parts will come from here. Okay. Q H would be Q1 uh, epsilon AB is a semi anti symmetric matrix. Okay. So the diagonal terms are 0. So 1, 2 is okay. Q1, 2. So U L H0 minus. Uh, one second, I'm sorry. Uh, minus dl h plus all multiplied by should, if you multiply by ur, you are fine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so oh, okay, 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 okay. I need a what is the notation I used for the problem? I'm For uptype, I should get this one. Okay, I should get so for uptype, I don't need any data. Okay, with the notation we used, I think this gives me you are var v r var h plus. With the notation of H I used, I think just check it actually. Okay, with, the, with the notation of H I used, I think H plus and H0, uh, unless I am making some mistake somewhere. Let us just check this actually. If I take the same notation as the, ah right, I think I already took H plus and H0, that is the reason. If I choose hypercharge plus half, it is fine. Okay, uh, the uptype will get this one. If I take leptons having the same hypercharge as the Higgs, okay, then I need to put a H tilde here on the uptype port. Okay, because leptons and the Higgs typically have the same hypercharge, but I already choose the opposite hypercharge for the Higgs, H plus and H0. Okay. So, um, so the Yukawa coupling is given by u bar h0, dl bar h0, u bar. Uh, everybody understands this notation, right? Any questions on the Yukawa coupling? No. Okay, fine. So u bar, whereas this will give me the down part mass matrix dl bar plus u bar dl h plus, but h plus goes to zero in the limit. When the symmetry is broken, so this term goes to zero. So it only gives you U R bar H zero U R. And then uh, this gives me DL bar D R H zero, and then this is giving me L bar P R.
So this is about the incorporate And then the last part is the symmetry breaking part. Symmetry broken in four dimensions. This is induced by a term. Uh, one last thing I uh, wanted to mention is that this each of them is a matrix. Each yij is a matrix. Yuij, ydij is a 3 by 3 complex matrix. Okay. Now LSSB, I have to make this correction over the pieces. Uh, LSSB is given by L kinetic for the Higgs, Higgs kinetic is given by W H W H minus V of H and V of H is equal to minus V H H double H minus lambda H double H. This has the famous uh, Mexican high potential, and so Higgs is equal to when symmetry is broken. Now, how do you convert this classical Lagrangian <coughs> R to the is equal to you can put a plus also, that's not a problem actually. I just put you can make it. Okay, now if it is you have to make sure that the equations of motion do not give you a minus sign for the master. Because the propagator should not be a ghost propagator. <laughs> In fact, this mass when it becomes negative, when it becomes tachyonic. So this entire classical Lagrangian, we will continue with the classical Lagrangian, in the symmetry breaking phase, in SSB phase, this will not change, this will not change in the SSB phase. But this part will change, okay, this part will change. This will change a little bit because there is some, um, the moment you get masses, some things from here will go to here, actually. Some things from here will go to here. Okay? At the level of classical Lagrangian, nothing will change here. Okay? Things will become very complicated. So in SSP phase, you just start to replace H2. I'm using something called the unitary gauge. 0 plus 0. Uh, v plus H plus I0. V is a constant where H is actually a classical field H of X. V is a constant. And when you minimize this potential, V will turn out to be minus mu of this And uh, everything will uh, come out to be mw square dg square d square half ah. r. Ah. If I put a v by root 2, no, it makes a difference. If I put a v by root 2, it becomes 1 by 4, and z square would be 1 by 4 d 
squared plus d times square d squared. And then we have an angle g prime by g is going to times square root. And everything is related with that. Uh, this part, should I repeat it? Uh, should, I, should I do it in more detail? I can do it if you want me to do it. But this is important actually. This is, uh, because I am just jumping it over and just glossing it over. I assume that you all know about it. And then the masses are given by mf equal to the curve coupling times the corresponding curve coupling times the value of x. That's it. After the symmetric breaking mechanism, you incorporate this and uh, you derive the Feynman rule symbol. Now, if you want to see uh, one good reference where you can find, of course, there are books like uh, Matthew Schwartz and everything. There is also Diagramatica by Wittmann. Where all the Feynman rules are given both in the break and phase as well as in the unbroken phase. Of course, then you can look at uh, Matthew Schwartz. Preston and Schroeder also has it. Preston and Schroeder also. Okay, and I also have some problems somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. I uh, now so you go from unbroken phase to broken phase. This will modify this, this will modify this. This will also a little bit modify this because it will give you mass terms in this when you write the equations. Okay, with this uh, we have uh, written the classical equation. I want to keep this and just tell what are all the symmetries, classical symmetries possible. And then, uh, then maybe in the next class I talk about the quantum symmetry. Classical symmetries means that the classical Lagrangian is invariant in the water symmetries. Okay, but what are other symmetries? Because this is important for us later on. For any physics beyond standard model, we will look into this. One is local gates. This is obvious. That if you transform any chromium psi into under some mu of theta psi n, where u of theta is equal to e power i liquid i for one gate symmetry essentially, okay. okay, theta of x, lambda of x, okay, theta of x, lambda a. So this is one gate symmetry where x is important actually. It's a local gate symmetry. So this theta, uh, this lambda plus, I am just writing in my notation, which is not mathematically correct. So you also have similarly for theta of x, theta a lambda a, theta b is a lambda b. Tau b. Uh, I think I use sigma. B. And then you have theta of x, y. This is because it's a direct product of gauge groups. I, in the exponentials, I wrote it as direct sum. Okay, don't take it mathematically correct. It's not mathematically correct. <laughs> okay, I just wrote it as. 
So there are these classical gate symmetries which you all know. Very interesting. These are important. Under this symmetry, the fermions transform as this. How do the gauge, gauge bosons transform? Gauge bosons transform as W mu A prime. Minus del mu theta okay, for the abelian gauge groups. For the non abelian gauge groups, what else you have? Structure function. Sorry for my notation. Okay, it looks terrible. Okay. F I J is F I J. By G. Okay, now this is uh, for the uh, transformation in delta. Ah, okay, fine, it's fine. Then we find. Or we can re express this as a second delta of this. Okay, now this is about the gate symmetries. Now, what are the other symmetries you can have? The other symmetry, this is a local gate symmetry. The second other symmetry which you can have, uh, some of these symmetries don't hold at the quantum level. Okay, but anyway, I'll just mention them at the classical level because we are doing. Classical. One is U1 Bayer number. It's a global symmetry. It's not a local symmetry. Okay. If you take all the quarks, quarks are Bayer number what? One by three. Okay. Rotate all the quarks. All the quarks in E power i is the barrier number okay, qi. The Lagrangian is invariant. The classical Lagrangian is invariant. The classical Lagrangian is invariant. Okay, barrier number. Secondly, individual left arm numbers are invariant. There are three left arm numbers. Okay, L E, L E, L E. Note that. These are not these are not quantum symmetries. Classical level, they are good symmetries. Baryon and lepton number. We keep hearing that baryon and lepton number is conserved in the classical level. But these are only really classical symmetries. At the quantum level, these are not valid. They are no longer symmetries at the quantum level. Okay. In fact, uh, you also keep hearing statements that because baryon and lepton number is conserved in the uh, in standard model, the proton doesn't decay. Okay, but that's also not completely correct. Okay, the actual symmetry for keeping proton stable is actually a discrete symmetry times the baryon number. Okay, the actual okay. that uh, okay. If you are interested, look at uh, recent paper by Smith Foreman and proton stability and standard model. Now, there are two more symmetries okay, uh, which are quite counterintuitive, which don't come um, directly. Okay, these are not even approximate symmetries. Okay, so one of the symmetries comes if I set 
this to zero. Okay, this is called flavor symmetry. Flavor symmetries appear in the standard model because LU cover goes to zero. For some reason, I go into the massless limit. So this can happen when your momenta is very, very high. So if you are sitting, imagine that you are sitting at momenta in which you can neglect all the masses of the standard particles. Sitting at 10 TeV or something, you have a 100 TeV collider or something. There, the flavor symmetry is approximate. Even at LHC actually, at certain level, the flavor symmetry is actually there. You don't care about the masses of the spots. Okay, if you are dealing with momenta which is 10 TeV, hundreds of TeV. The only thing which is dominantly breaking flavor symmetry is the top part mass. Okay? Most of the time, the mass of the top part is so heavy because it's very, very close to V by root 2. Okay? It's very, very close to the V by root 2. So you worry about the top part mass. But otherwise, if you go to very heavy mass energy range, say for example, tens of TeV, you can even neglect that. But if you are looking at TeV range, you only have to care about the top mass. Okay. So what is the symmetry? This symmetry, because the gauge doesn't distinguish between different generations, it is the same, it replicates again exactly the same way. So the only thing it sees is the chiral structure of the theory. It only looks at the chiral structure of the theory. So you can bunch, say for example, QL for first generation, Q2, QL2 for second generation, QL3 for second and third generation. Put it in a multiplet, QL1, QL2, or what do you call Q1, Q2, Q3, which means essentially left handed up first generation quarks, left handed second generation quarks, left handed third generation quarks, and rotated them away, the Lagrangian is invariant. Okay? This is a U3 symbol. gauge theory doesn't distinguish between the different. So there is already some indications of rotation because when you look at, uh, when you study the standard model, um, you already see that, say for example, Z gives some sort of universality. Z going to EE, Z going to mu mu, Z going to tau tau. You can neglect the masses of the E mu tau. And what happens, these ratios should be same. Okay? These ratios because the gauge couples is exactly the same way to all the three generations. Okay. So this is a U in three symmetry. Similarly, you have U R1, U R2, all the three generations. Again, another U3 symmetry. So the total number of symmetries you can have is U3 power 5. Why? Because there is Q, U, D, L. So this symmetry automatically kicks in in gauge interaction. In many gauge interactions, say for example, if we are producing a bunch of FF bar fermions, essentially, you would expect all the cross sections to be the same. Okay? If you are going, except for the top quark, again I'm saying, when you are living at, at TV scales, you would expect the top quark is the only one which makes a difference. Okay? All the top, down, bottom, uh, strange decay should be roughly the same. So this leads to something called the universality. In various decay processes or cross sections and so on. So okay. the most famous one is the Z universality. Z universality. I am only introducing those features of the standard model which are going to be useful for me, <laughs> which will violate any of these things. Okay, That's the reason I am introducing it. Okay. Yeah. So, the most famous Z going to FF bar. One of the most famous thing of the Z to FF bars. Okay. And Higgs also has a sum. But does Higgs have universal? No. Because Higgs breaks explicitly 
or the complaints by the proportion to their masses. Okay. So before the uh, spontaneous symmetry begins, then uh, there are also um, the feedback loops that are uh, uh, their masses. Then also there is rehydrate Yeah. Because any attenuated scale in which you can neglect the masses, mm -hmm. if we neglect the masses, then spontaneous symmetry will not have any effect on the fermions. The moment you set the masses to zero, it's like the spontaneous symmetry breaking doesn't care. So it doesn't distinguish between different generations. The only thing which distinguishes different generations is their masses. The moment you set the masses to be zero, there is no distinction between generations. Okay, Z will go into F of R or W will go into F and mu E, mu E, okay, whatever it is, whatever it decays are, everything will remain the same. So there is some sort of universal. Okay, as long as your energy, say for W and Z, it is valid for electron, muon, tau, and up to a certain extent for the bottom mass. Okay, but the top W cannot decay into top, Z cannot decay into the top. So the universality in the up sector doesn't hold. But for the down sectors, electron, muon, tau, D, S, B, it holds very well. Okay, all the gauge interactions, W or Z. Okay, then there is a very another important uh, symmetry. Uh, any questions on clear symmetries? U3 power 5 clear symmetries. Okay, there are 5 U3 groups. Okay, 5 U3 groups, each for one chiral structure. Okay, 5 U3 groups. Finally, there is a symmetry of the SSB. This I will do, introduce today at the classical level, and then we will talk about it at the quantum level later on, or so maybe in the next class. So, SSB is a mu x, x times h plus x minus lambda h times h. Also. Now let's take it in the unbroken phase. In unbroken phase, this is a scalar. This is scalar. Oh, Lagrangian, all Lagrangians are scalar. Nothing surprising about okay. But H is a doublet. No? H has two complex quantities, H plus and H zero. Two complex phase. Now let me write V expresses Lagrangian in terms of four real fields, four real fields, because each of them has a value of x. So this, I write it as pi one plus i pi two, pi three plus i pi four, before symmetry breaking, again, okay. Okay. then mu h, Okay, there is also this kind of And this entire thing, you can re express everything in terms of 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4. There is a symmetry which is called S4. This symmetry goes by the name first Is just obvious, meaning the implications are not known at the classical level. I'll talk about the quantum level. At the classical level, it gives me one relation the custodial symmetry. It says uh, W goes on mass and Z goes on mass very close to each other. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and so forth, symmetry in the sense that we have. 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4, and the total Lagrangian, you can rotate it into the so forth, and the total Lagrangian is invariant. Okay? The Higgs part, you don't, it's not, it's broken.
broken by car couplings, it's broken by the gauge coupling part and everything. Okay? But because of the SO4 symmetry, it tells you whatever is broken also, even after symmetry breaking, it's approximately conserved. Okay? In the unbroken phase, it's exactly conserved. Okay? In the broken phase, it's approximately conserved and it will have replication essentially. It will have replication. So this is called first order symmetry. Then there are other symmetries which uh, are not exactly symmetries. Okay, uh, I, I'll come to that puzzle when I introduce QCD. Essentially, okay, there is one term in QCD which we need to cover. Okay, so but this is uh, uh, any questions on so far? So we looked at the classical Lagrangian, wrote it in different parts, and now. We also wrote down the uh, the corresponding classical symmetries. So the next step would be to look at the quantum Lagrangian and look at. I won't do the full renormalization of the sample, but I'll just mention some basic features at the quantum level. What are important? And then we'll move to what are the reasons why we need to go to the beyond standard. Stop here and then we we'll meet again on Thursday. Any questions so far? Okay.